Open your Bibles for Scripture reading this morning to the book of John chapter 20. Book of John chapter 20. I'm speaking on the subject, Be not faithless, but believing. Be not faithless, but believing. I'm going to give you the outline really quickly of the things that Jesus dealt with as he met with the disciples. First, there were a lot, there's a lot of fear that was in their hearts at that time. And Jesus dealt with the fear that they were experiencing. There were also many doubts, and so he dealt with their faith. The last thing that he dealt with, we find in chapter 21, he dealt with their failure. And every one of us experienced those things. We experience fear, we experience doubts, and our faith is affected, unbelief, and we, we deal with failure because we are human. And the wonder of God is He loved us in spite of it all. He knows our fears. He knows our lack of faith. And He also knows our failures. And quite frankly, that's why He came. Because he knew that without him going to the cross, and definitely without resurrecting, we would have no hope. This is a season of hope. I'm not talking about the government, because the government can't provide this kind of hope. I'm talking about eternal hope. I'm talking about a hope that is is a hope that be, is beyond any full assurance that an insurance company could give you, uh, it, beyond any kind of guarantee anybody in this world could ever give you. God has written in His Word a guarantee that beats every guarantee that is in the universe. And that guarantee is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's... Bow our heads for prayer, and as we, have read the, as we read the scriptures after that, then we'll get into the preaching. Our Father, we ask now that you would bless your word, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts, challenge us today from your word. We do thank you for all the things that we've been able to experience thus far. It was a joy to be in the fellowship, looking forward to what the boys and girls are going to experience afterwards, the fun that they will have. But now we come to a very important time, and that's a time to meet with you. To be able to gaze upon the life of the most wonderful man, the God-man, who walked on this planet. He was only here for 33 years, but the impact is far-reaching and is eternal. Never a man was like Jesus. Bless our time now in the Word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pick up the story in verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, 
but believing. That's the text verse we're taking, the title of the message to this morning. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. When the resurrection occurred, if you look in verse number 19, the Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, what's the phrase? For fear of the Jews. Did any of you happen to remember the lie that was being purported about the disciples after the resurrection? They were accused of coming and stealing the body. And people believed it. And so they were hiding out. It's interesting Jesus met with them on the first of the week. Jesus was on the earth for 40 days before he left and he ascended. He was not with them every day. He was weaning himself from that bodily presence. And in this meeting, before Thomas shows up, in the first meeting, he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's significant. Because what that meant was now they would be indwelt as believers and they wouldn't need his bodily presence because the bodily presence of the Holy Spirit would be with them from then on. When a child of God, when any of us trust Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in us and he lives in us. And we don't need the bodily presence of Jesus because we have the spiritual presence of God, the Holy Spirit, inside us every single day. So they're in the room and Jesus appears on the first day of the week, eight days later. Same time, same station, first day of the week, he meets again. In the first experience, he shows them his hands and feet. In the second experience, he also shows him his hands and feet, but he directs everything specifically to Thomas. Nobody knows what Jesus did in the time he was away from the disciples. To try to speculate would be silly. We don't know. But what we do know is that every time he met them, he was real. And every time he appeared to them, they recognized him. They knew his voice, and they saw his hands, and they saw his feet. I meet with people on a weekly basis, and we all do. And in our conversations, people are always questioning Jesus. Many have a fear of letting go and trusting him because of what other people might think of them. Maybe their family, maybe their friends, maybe co-workers. And so there's that fear that keeps them from a personal relationship with Christ that started in the garden when man sinned and they hid from God. And it's no different here. The disciples were struggling with the loss of Jesus. Now, if you read all of the accounts of the resurrection and of the burial and of all that went on after the cross, you will find that there's a lot going on in the minds of the disciples. It was Passover, the holiest day of the year. And not only had, were they dealing with the fact that their Savior, who they had followed for three years, that man that uh, for Peter and James and John and Andrew stopped when they were fishing or mending their nets and said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. 
Matthew, who was at the receipt of custom collecting taxes, and he just says, follow me, and he drops what he's doing. He comes around wherever, the, the, wherever he was, and he just dropped everything and followed Jesus. These men followed him for, 12, for, for three years. Now he's dead. So here's the dynamic of all the things going on in their mind. This all happened the day of preparation, which was the day before Sabbath. And Jesus, being dead, was absolutely shocking and astonishing to them. They were not, that was not in the plan. Now, he had told them, he had prepared them, he had told them, but they, it just didn't compute. They weren't believing it, that he would die. That's why he came. He came to die for the sins of his people. And now they have Passover that by Jewish law, they have, to, they have to celebrate. This is not an option in, Jewish, in the Jewish faith. And so there was prepare, preparation for it, but at the same time, they're mourning. Try to do that at the same time. They're, they, they are still not processed. They have not fully processed the fact that Jesus is dead and some of them not only are preparing for Passover, but they're involved in the preparation of his body for burial. And it's just too much. And so <clears throat> the women come and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen, and Peter and John in verse 2 go running to the tomb. And Peter still is struggling because Peter, remember, denied the Lord. And John was a little more timid, and that, that fear we're talking about, he was afraid to walk in. Peter is just as bold as a, he's like a bull in a china shop. He just runs, rushes right into the tomb. But Peter doesn't recognize what he sees. John does. He sees the grave clothes, and he sees the napkin off of his face, sitting over in the corner. And the Bible says he believed. Peter did not. Peter was still not himself. So all this dynamic is going on. Fear. <coughs> what do you fear that hinders you from trusting Christ? What is it in life that you're afraid of to let go and let God? <clears throat> you know, in America, we don't have it as bad as other countries because in other countries, here's the, here's the deal. If you trust Christ in a nation that is not Christian, it could mean your life. And many will trust Christ anyway. And they are martyred. And it happens every day. We're in America. We don't, we don't, I mean, the most that we usually get will be, you know, some kind of a wisecrack. Maybe some physical scuffle. We've seen a few shootings in schools that were religiously related. But as a whole in America, we don't face what the other countries do. So we have a freedom to come to Christ without that tyranny and without that persecution. But we still don't. There's fear. Secondly, there's doubt. We all have doubts about a lot of things. People will come and they'll tell us something and what, what's the first thing a lot of people say? I don't believe it. And the reason you, won't, you don't believe it and the reason none of us believe those things is because we were not there. We didn't see it ourselves. So we, we feel like because we did not verify it ourselves, we were not there ourselves, that then it couldn't possibly be true because after all, nobody has any more sense than we do. I mean, nobody else could verify something, and we couldn't take their word for it 
After all, we're the final word, right? And so that kind of doubt is in all of us. And we deal with that. We, we deal with that with the promises of God. We deal with that in every aspect of our life. And, and so we question, can God really take care of me? Did God really mean what he said? Is this really true? Thomas was the one who dealt with that the most. Now imagine that statement. Until I take my finger and I stick it in his hands. And my fist and thrust it up in his side. Would you do that? I mean, honestly. You think he would have done that? He didn't. But see, we, we, make, we, 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 we make things, we say things with our mouth that we don't really think about and think through. And we may not vocalize them to other people, but we vocalize them, and don't you think God hears those things? By the way, he heard every word Thomas said. And the staggering thing to Thomas is eight days later when he comes and he meets and Thomas is there, he quotes what Thomas says verbatim. Thomas falls on his face and he says, my Lord and my God. 